put that chorus up one more time, Len? So just make this your prayer, everybody. Just you and the Lord. Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Be magnified in me. It's not somebody else's job to show everybody who Jesus is. It's not something that just magically happens. We are his body. We're his family. We're his people. May he be magnified in us. Amen? Amen. So that's actually what we're going to be talking about today. We're wrapping up our series in 2 Timothy. And today we're going to hear the final recorded words of St. Paul. And so um, I'm going to have Rick Lindsay come up and read it in a second. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed studying 2 Timothy as much as I have. It's been, it's been awesome to see him sharing wisdom and encouragement and challenge with his protege and how we can learn from that, uh, that transaction through the Holy Spirit of wisdom and challenge. And then, and then also, it's, it's interesting to just, just think about um, Paul going off the scene and handing on the ball to his, his young apprentice and how people have gone ahead of you, how people have gone ahead of me and have poured into my life, poured into your life, who are now off the scene. And then what would the Lord want us to do next with glorifying him in and through our lives? So as Rick reads this, I want you to picture Paul uh, in prison, writing a note to his son in the faith and to all of us, and I, I think there were probably a lot of mixed emotions. I don't think he was just wrapped and sad, because that's not how he comes across in any of his letters. He sees it as very purposeful that he's there, but he knows that his time is short, and he wants to get the right things off of his chest for Timothy. So, come on up, Rick. <clears throat> In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus... Who will judge the living and the dead? And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus in Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. 
Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first offense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Puddens, Linus, and Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. Amen. Thank you, Rick. How would you have done with all those names he just read? Man, oh man. That's why I picked a teacher for that job. So today we're going to talk about finishing well. Take a look at this picture. Sometimes life feels a little bit like that. But uh, it seems like a lot of people start well and don't finish so hot. Whether they're Christians or not, in the church or not, our intention is to finish well, and yet a lot of things can happen on that, on that road. How many of you think you could uh, run a marathon tomorrow? Okay, how many of you could start a marathon tomorrow? Right? We could all start. The question is, can we finish? So today we're going to talk about what, is it, what does it mean to be ready to finish? Uh, 2 Timothy 4.1, we're going to start with that first verse. He says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. This is what John was talking about last week. In view of the coming of Christ, in view of his kingdom, in view of our future eternally, then how do we view our lives now? How do we view physical life in view of eternity? Um, and how are we going to live today? And then in light of that, he says, so Timothy, based on Jesus appearing, based on the future kingdom, based on all this, I'm going to give you this charge. And he charges him with a couple things. It's not just preach the word. That's the first one. But if we look for all the action words, how many of you have been to school before? You underline the verbs, right? Sometimes you're looking for the action stuff. So, um, so he says, first preach the word. Then he says, be prepared. And he says, correct errors. So um, I think something that's interesting is sometimes we are shocked and afraid and tipped over by errors. And, and Paul, in all of his writings, says people are going to be wrong. They're going to say the wrong stuff. They're going to be false teachers. They're going to be false prophets. All kinds of stuff is going to be dicey and weird. Don't let it shock you. Address it. Correct it. Do your job right? We don't run the other way. We say, oh, that's wrong. I, I'm going to point out how that's wrong. And then he says, keep your head. Um, and then the last part, he's, he talks about doing the work. Do the work of ministry. So this is his final charge to his uh, son in the faith. Um, why is he telling Tim these things? Because he's, dis he's going off the scene. And he's saying, uh, I'm not going to be here anymore. So here's what I want you to focus on, and it's time for you to carry the ball. So think about who has come before you in your faith. How did you end up following Jesus? Are some of those people already gone? Now it's your turn to carry the faith. Are some of those people aging? Like I think about my parents. They're not going to be here forever. They were very instrumental in my faith. 
but they're not going to be here forever. And so now it's our turn. If you're here and you're breathing, it's our turn to carry the ball of faith, to help others to find out who Jesus is. Not somebody else's job, not a previous generation's job, not Billy Graham's job. He's gone, right? And, and made a tremendous, incredible impact on the planet. And he's gone. And I actually met the Lord watching a Billy Graham crusade with my mom on TV. Fascinating. But how do we carry forward these things now? And just ask yourself right now, how am I doing with that charge? Am I carrying forward the message of Christ in my life now? Well, I'm doing nice things for other people, and I read my Bible every day. Sort of. But really, have you said, I want to carry the ball? I want to do my part in this generation of showing and telling who Jesus is. That's important. That was where someone should have said amen, Len. Can you say amen real, real amen. Okay, there we go. Yay, Len's back. Um, but usually he sits up here, Rick, so you're going to have to give me some amens from up here. So 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. This is where we really hear Paul's farewell. He says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure is near. So what is a drink offering? So if we look back in the book of Leviticus, a drink offering often accompanied a burnt offering. Actually, Exodus, 24 is, Exodus 29 is the best place to find it. After sacrificing a lamb or a ram, the priest would, um, would pour oil around the base of the sacrifice. And it was a symbol of worship. It was a symbol of of a pouring out of himself. And, and so it's, it's, that's, what, um, that's what Paul is referring to, is that act uh, of worship at the altar. And it reminds us of something else Paul said in Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So he's saying, my body, myself, my life, you know, uh, life blood is already being poured out as a sacrifice. In fact, it just feels like, you know, he, he's nearing the end of his life, he knows his time is, is short, and he's picturing how his life has already been given over towards the Lord and poured out for others, similar to his Lord, right? Similar to Jesus pouring out his life for others. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Just hey, look at those. I want to be able to say these things. I hope you want to be able to say these things, whether you live another 30 years or another 30 days. I want to be able to say those things. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Again, this is what John talked about last week. Do we think about the return of Jesus? Do we long for it? That is a challenge, to wake up every day and go, could, could today be the day? Are we looking forward to seeing him at all? Um, what if you knew, what if you got a text right now from your doctor, and, and you were like, well, I'll look at it in church, you know, and, I, and the text said, you got six months to live. And it's this special kind of cancer, and we know that it's exactly six months. So you are going to be gone on April 23. Uh, just wanted to let you know. <laughs> right? Um, in a way, it's kind of good to know, right? But what are some things that you would change in your life spiritually? Now, I don't mean, oh, we got to do that Hawaii trip. <laughs> but... What would you be thinking if I got six months, not six days, not six years, six months? That's enough time to get some stuff moved in the right direction, to make some changes in your life, right? What would you change right now if you knew six months is all I have? What would you do? I was talking with a friend of mine this week. His dad has three to six months. And so he's literally figuring out what am I going to do with my six months? And, and so... Think about that. What would you do? Now, here's, here's the follow-up question. How do you know that you don't have six months? 
None of us know. I mean, that's one of the truths about the human condition. I might have six months. You might have six months. We don't know. So I want to live into that. I want to start living like I have six months now. Because if I have six months, I won't have any regrets. But if, I'm, if I put off the stuff I need to become, the stuff I need to work on, you know, yeah, I should eventually share Jesus with my mom, just put it off. I may have some regrets when I face the Lord someday, and I'm like, I didn't know I had six months. And he's like, no one does. <laughs> That's the whole idea. You don't know how long you have, so you have to invest the time while you have it. There's a bunch of parables in here that Jesus taught about the master coming back at a time when you don't know. That's the whole idea. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Amen to that? So um, I, <laughs> I want to have no regrets. And whenever I think about no regrets, it reminds me of a really funny thing that I saw. It's somebody who went and got a tattoo of no regrets because they never wanted to forget that. And it said no regrets. <laughs> and so for their whole life, they have to look at their arm and go like, I regret that. Okay, maybe that will help you remember it this week. So, but it's human nature to value beginnings more than endings. Like, we like births more than funerals, right? And there's something in our culture, especially about startups, about, ooh, the new this or the new restaurant or the new, you know, whatever. Um, but God values endings more than beginnings. So... Let me, let me prove it to you. Ecclesiastes 7, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. So we could just be done right there, but there's more. Philippians 3, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Philippians 1, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. Galatians 5, you are running a good race. But who cut in on you and kept you from obeying? In other words, you were doing fine. Why'd you quit? Why didn't you finish? 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. How do I translate that? Well, at least I'm doing better than you. <laughs> no, right? That, that actually reminds me of, of, of a joke. There are two missionaries in Africa, and they run into a terrifying lion, right? And so the one missionary gets down and ties his shoes, and the other guy goes like, what are you doing? There is no way you're going to outrun a lion, you moron. And he says, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> it took you long enough to get that. Okay, now... Um, so, but, but there, there's even more. Matthew 24, uh, it says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Notice the end. There's this big theme. Acts 20, I consider my life worth nothing to me. This is, um, uh, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. And that's Paul speaking. But our culture says he who dies with the most toys wins. But in God's perspective, no. In fact, that, that could be, a, be proof that they don't win. Because whoever dies with the most ties, uh, toys still what? They still die. Yeah, and you can't take it with you. Somebody once said, I, I never saw... Uh, a hearse with a trailer. You can't take your stuff with you. It just, it just does not happen. So Paul was saying to Timothy, you started really well. Good job, buddy. In fact, we learned early on, he was carrying on the faith of his grandmother and his mother, and evidently dad did not have a big part in his faith. So he's carrying forward their tradition. And then Paul is saying, make sure that you finish well. And Paul is explaining in 2 Timothy 4, here's how I am finishing well. Follow my example. Take this charge. Um, continue and finish well. But 
um, let, let's talk about what do we actually mean? Because we can say finish well, finish well, finish well. Who cares if we don't define it? What does it actually mean in our lives, practically, for you and me to finish well? Uh, I found a definition that I really like from the navigators. And, and they said it this way. Let, let's, let's read it together. So one, two, three. Finishing well means following Christ to the very end of our lives. Finishing his assignments for us and hearing his well done, good and faithful servant. I love that definition because it doesn't just say, don't screw up. Right? It doesn't say, don't fall in this way or this way. It doesn't say, be a success and have a big 401k. It's really about, what has Christ called me to do? Did I do that? Did I do it to the end? Did I fulfill the calling that he placed on my life? And if you are a believer in Jesus, he has called you to follow him. He's given you his spirit. He's given you gifts to serve others and build up his body. The question is, did we do it or not? And then when we face him, he's not going to you know, say, you know, Rob, you know that thing that you did. And then this thing that you did, and then this thing that you did, I'm not so cool with those things. And then you have to have this negotiation with, please, Lord, let me in. It's really like, what did you do with what I gave you? Did you, were you the Rob I created you to be? Is really the conversation. And, and the conversation doesn't start when you get to heaven. The conversation starts now with, Lord, who do you want me to be? How can I fulfill what, what you have desired for my life to become? And that starts now so that you're not surprised in six months when you're, right? Okay. How do you know you don't have six months? Just, I'm just saying. Okay. So, um, so we're going to talk about some things that will help us finish well. But here's the thing. Some churches would say, if you do these four things, you will be assured of finishing well. With a deep voice. And I would say, kind of. And here's what I mean. We need God's grace. So I need to do my part in putting things in place in my life so that I'm set up to finish well. And then I need to say, Lord, I am at your grace. I need your mercy. I need the power of your Holy Spirit to even do that. So I do my part. He does his part. Okay. So how do we finish well? Number one, start the work he's given you to do. You can't finish a race unless you, right? And a journey of a 1,000 miles begins with a single. So if you have no idea what God has called you to do, ask him. If you're not sure what to do about it, ask your Christian friend. How do I do what he's called me to do? How do I develop the gifts he's given me? How do I get involved in loving other people and serving them with my life? Ephesians 2 you are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he pre prepared in advance for you to do. That's not about just me. It's not just about John. It's about all of us. We are created from the beginning to walk into good stuff that he's planned for us. That, that's the promise. So if you haven't started, it ain't too late. You're still here, you're still breathing. Start what he has called you to do. Number two, walk in intimacy with God and others. Um, Jesus said, remain in me and you will bear much fruit. And John 15 talks about abiding in him. And he says, a branch by itself dies. Stay connected. And the whole New Testament is about cooperating together and being connected to each other. And there are so many people that just go, Jesus and me and I'm fine. No, not so much. If you don't have people in your life, you are in grave danger. And, and I've talked about that, like we talked about it on Super Bowl Sunday, that I don't care how good of an NFL player you are, if you go in alone, you will probably die. It takes a team. And so I've, I was part of the, um, the community group that met over at the Thurmans on Thursday night. It was beautiful to see everybody connected to each other and um, operating in their gifts and sharing the gospel with each other. And it was just, it was powerful. So make sure that you have uh, 
closeness with the Lord and closeness with others, and that's one way of making sure you can finish well. I, I love this, this definition too. Somebody wants, Somebody said, have healthy relationships with resourceful people. I like that. Because you could have healthy relationships with dorks. <laughs> right? And, and you can have people in your life that you don't really know very well that are very resourceful. The, the goal is, do you have the right people around you to make you stronger in the Lord? And if you don't, say, Lord, I don't have those. And he will show you how to have those. Number three, have a teachable and humble spirit. Often people who fail or fall think they're bulletproof. They think they can do it alone. They're like, I got this. They don't got this. None of us is capable of living the Christian life or the human life alone. And we need to have a, a humility about that. We need to understand that we are capable of falling. We are capable of failing. We need to have stuff in our life, accountability, and love and study and disciplines with the Lord that help us not go down that road. So let me just ask a, a question. Uh, think about your life for a second. Is there anything in your life that could disqualify you from finishing well? And here's what I mean. Uh, nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, you know, I think I'm going to have an affair this year. And nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, I should become an alcoholic. Those things, that just is not how it works. These things happen with thousands of small decisions over time. And so the Lord wants to speak to all of our hearts and say, hey, be careful of this. And be careful of this because this could disqualify you. And don't continue this habit or this direction or this tendency or this way of thinking because that could disqualify you. So how do you, like if I'm going to run a marathon, there are a couple things that I need to do to finish. One is not quit, right? Another one is not cheat, right? And another one is probably train and understand that this is serious. But there are ways in which we disqualify ourselves because we haven't made those right choices. Um, okay, let's talk about number four. So we've talked about starting the work he gave you to do. We've talked about having the right relationships with him and others, having a humble, teachable spirit. That, yes, Lord, what do you want to do in me? No, I can't do this alone. Yes, I need your help. The last thing is finish the work. There are a lot of people that start the work and don't finish the work. There are a lot of people that it gets hard, it gets difficult. I think in some churches... Um, we, we're sold this, this package that if you accept Jesus, things will be easier for you and you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise. It'll all be great. Just sign here and go out that door and everything is shiny. And that's not really real life. Uh, life doesn't get easier, but it gets a lot better because now I don't go through it alone because I have him, right? And I have you guys. So... So we, we have this challenge in Scripture to not quit even when it gets hard, and it will. So how many of you have ever found that life can get difficult? Would you raise your hand? Okay, you're in the right church. 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Rick read that a little bit ago, right? He's in prison waiting to be killed. And then he knows that God will bring him safely through it. What does that mean? That means he understands his eternal state and his eternal safety is more important than his physical safety. Sometimes we screw that up and we're like, woe is me, I have this problem with my leg. And, and it's not a spiritual problem. Now, is it serious? Sure. But in eternity, is it serious? No. He, ha he totally got that. Paul totally got that. And then he talked about how he had, he had found the secret of, of being um, content in every situation. And sometimes he, they wanted to hurt him, and sometimes they wanted to accept him. But he was content no matter what came at him. Galatians 6, 
Let us not become weary in doing good. I know some of you in this room are weary. I know some of you watching online are weary. There's a lot going on in your life and in our world. And then it says, at the proper time we will reap a harvest. Look at the last phrase, if we do not give up. If things get hard and we get up, give up, we don't get to see the result. We don't get to see what God is working in us and around us through the process of the, t- the tough stuff. And usually in life, anything worth doing is a little difficult. That's just kind of normal human life, especially spiritual life. John 17, Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So Jesus said to his father, I have finished. Just like Paul said, I have finished. We, can all, we must always keep the end in mind, the finish line in mind. Uh, and um, second, second Corinthians 5, let's do this one. So we make it our goal to please him whether we're at home in the the body or away from it. Notice that eternal perspective. What does away from the body mean? You're dead, right? You're still pleasing him even when you're dead. And then he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So I've been thinking about this. Do I really want to see Jesus? How do I feel today about, like, if today was the day, would I be stoked to see him? Or would I be like, oh, shoot. Like, I got to talk to you today? I think that's a a good, like, thing I got to think about each day. Am I excited to see him if today was the day? And if I'm not excited to see him, what does that mean about some stuff in me that needs to be addressed? Because I want to live each day excited to see my Lord. And that is one really important aspect of finishing well. And notice the words from Matthew 25. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. It doesn't say good and faithful CEO or boss or pastor or missionary or grandpa or wife. Or hu- It says servant. So we are servants who serve the king. And I want to hear well done, you did well serving more than the other stuff. So let's look at the very end of 2 Timothy. He talks about the greetings and the farewells and say hi to so-and-so and and -and so-and-so and bring that with you and I can't wait to see you, make it before winter and this and that. But the very last verse, he says, the Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you all. And that is the word charis, which means favor and it means blessing. And it means kindness. And so he is saying, may God's grace fill up what you don't have. May God's grace empower you. May God's grace carry you through. Because it's really all about God's grace. In his, because of his grace, because of his, um, his compassion, his favor in your life, he rescued you, he called you, he empowered you, he sent you, he forgave you. He takes care of you. He carries you through the difficulty in life. Because of his grace, he doesn't have to. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you all that you need for life on earth so that you can finish well as you lean into his grace. So you are going to face things that are too much. And that's when you fall back in his grace and say, I can't do this. And he goes, I know, I'm here. And there are times when you're going to say, like, Lord, I just really need it. And he goes, I know. Thank you for asking me. Because we need his grace. Hebrews 4 says, let us then approach the throne of grace. The throne of grace. Not the throne of judgment. Not the throne of terror. Not the throne even of holiness. I love how it says the throne of grace. With confidence. So we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. If you need that grace and that help, ask in confidence because you know Jesus. You can ask any time for help. So we finish up the book of 2 Timothy. Paul puts down his pen. 
he has written this letter that will be delivered, um, probably by Luke. And then sometime soon after that, he's taken out of the Mamertine prison. He's taken to the Basilica Julia, which was written by, uh, built by Julius Caesar. And there he stands trial before Nero. He is found guilty. He is sentenced to death. Now, this is interesting. He is sentenced to noble death because he's a Roman citizen. He can't be crucified. He can't be stoned. He has to be beheaded because that is a noble death. So Paul was taken just outside of Rome on the Appian Road. His head was placed on a block. A soldier with just an axe as his weapon was in their company. And with one final swipe, Paul the Apostle went instantly to his eternal home. And God's grace carried St. Paul all the way through, changed his life drastically from one who persecuted and killed and jailed Christians and hated the name of Jesus to someone who was willing to die and finish well for the cause of Jesus. And God's grace carried Timothy as well, and we know that Timothy ended his service of the Lord very well as the pastor in Ephesus. And just like the words of the song, they say, grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. I want to ask the band to come up, and we're going to sing that song together, Amazing Grace, and a little bit more, and then we're going to pray about what the Lord would have us say to him. So let's sing.